We will now proceed with the next plenary lecture. So our next speaker is Prof Stuart Parking, winner of the 2040 Millennium Technology Prize, and the title of his talk would be Chiral Spin Textures on the Racetrack. The Q&A session will be moderated by Prof Lam Ping Khoi. Prof Parking, please. Okay, first I check the microphone. Can you hear me? Good? No good? Oh, no, it's good. Okay, so, uh, uh, good morning. I'm very pleased to tell you something about the field of spintronics, which is my speciality. And in particular, I'd like to tell you about some recent work concerning chiral spin textures. So, um, I want to give you a little bit of background about who I am. Uh, this, you can see in this video, this is a recent video we shot of the laboratories that I have built with my colleagues uh, in Germany since I moved there five years ago. Originally, I was born in the UK, uh, moved around when I was young from London, Manchester, Edinburgh, Oxford, and went to college in Cambridge, where I'm an honorary fellow at Trinity College today, uh, with a lot of advice from Richard Friend, who comes to Singapore very often. And then I moved to Paris to work with Denis Jerome on organic superconductors. They had just been discovered when I went there. Finally, I moved to San Jose, California, where I joined IBM Research. This is a, a view of my house in California. Uh, but I got married uh, in 2014 so I, to a German chemist, Claudia Felser. So I moved to Germany and moving from sunny California, then this is a typical a picture of the institute uh, in this part of the year. Difficult to get used to. Nevertheless, uh, I want to give you also a brief introduction. So I'm a director at one of the 84 institutes of the Max Planck Society in Germany. And it, uh, the Max Planck Society has about 20,000 people altogether. And its mission is to carry out world-leading fundamental research. It's one of the premier research institutes we feel in the world, second most highly cited after Harvard. Now my actual interest is in doing cutting edge research, but with a view to technological impact. Can we change the world, have impact on society? I think this makes it more exciting when one is at the nexus of discovery and invention and application. This is where my institute is. It's in a small city called Halle. It's a very old city, about one hour from Berlin. So the context of my talk is that we, 500 years ago, a fantastic technological revolution. Johannes Gutenberg, a German scientist in the city of Mainz, invented the movable type press. And this was the first time you could print books. And this concept then of book printing led to the age, if you like, of the Enlightenment, because knowledge could be spread more widely. Now this age of analog book printing lasted 500 years, so it was an amazing invention. And 50 years ago, IBM Corporation in San Jose, California, where I lived for 30 years, invented a concept called a magnetic disk drive. And this is shown just a picture of a modern day magnetic disk drive. It's a disk which is rotated under a recording head and on the disk is a very thin uh, 10 nanometer thick magnetic film which is magnetized so the magnetic moment, the North Pole, points up or it points down. And the transition, and this, in this picture you can see an image where we have imaged a series of these magnetic regions with decreasing size. Over the last 50 years, the size of the magnetic region in which we store a single magnetic bit, north is one, let's say south is down, has uh, decreased in size by a billion times in 50 years. I want to tell you, the last four orders of magnitude was due to spintronics and some of my own work. So today, if you look in the cloud, what do you see? You basically see enormous numbers of computing nodes, but also enormous numbers of magnetic disk drives. And it was only 10 years ago that a year's supply of magnetic disk drives could store all the information in the world since the beginning of mankind. Now, of course, in the last 10 years, the amount of digital data is expanding enormously uh, with the billions of devices connected through the internet. But nevertheless, this has created enormous wealth and enormous uh, in the form of new companies like Facebook and Google. So if you like, uh, this is a very nice paper which discusses just 10 to 15 years ago, we started to move from the world of books, analog world of storing data, to the world of digital data, zeros and ones, 
predominantly, even today, in magnetic disk drives that still store more than 70% of all the digital data today. So I want to introduce to you a device that I invented, and it is based on spintronics. So you're all familiar with current. It will consist of electrons flowing through a wire, let's say. But the electrons have a spin, a quantum mechanical property. The electron spin takes a value plus half or minus a half. And IBM considered the work that I did one of its most important inventions in the 100-year history of the corporation, which it celebrated a few years ago. Now, what happens uh, with a spin? You're most familiar with this in magnets. A magnet is derived from the electron spins aligning themselves parallel to one another. Each of them has a tiny magnetic moment. And a very interesting uh, memory based on magnetism is something called magnetic core memory. And this is a, a very early version, uh, 50 years old. You see these small magnetic rings, and these magnetic rings can be magnetized in either a clockwise direction or in an anti-clockwise direction. This corresponds to a zero and a one. And through the middle of each of these rings, you can see these copper wires, these green and orange wires. You have two wires crossing through each ring. If you pass a current through the wire, it will generate a self-amperian magnetic field. And the combination of two fields from two wires at a cross point gives a big enough field that you can change the orientation of the magnetization from clockwise to anticlockwise. This is a very early form of memory, and it has a particular advantage that it's radiation hard. And this is used for space applications for a number of years. But back now to the electron spin. If you take a non-magnetic metal like copper and you introduce uh, from a battery a current consisting of equal numbers of spin up and spin down electrons shown as these blue and red dots, then the current is carried equally, but the current is not spin polarized. However, if you take a magnetic material, let's say this blue material, could be iron, it could be cobalt, it could be nickel, you introduce this unpolarized current from a battery and within a few scattering lengths as the electrons scatter from the magnetic moments which are oriented in a particular direction, electrons with one spin are scattered more than electrons with the opposite spin. This leads to a current that is innately spin polarized. It now carries spin polarization and an important property of spin is not the magnetic moment, it's the spin angular momentum. And this angular momentum we could use if we deliver enough of these electrons which are spin polarized to create a torque in the same way that uh, in the mechanical world you can create torques from angular momentum, we can create spin torques from spin angular momentum. I'm going to come back to that later, but here the point is that scattering gives rise to a spin polarized current. Now let's what happens if we take a sandwich. The red layer has a magnetization pointing to the left, the blue layer to the right, and in between we have a thin layer of copper. Each of these layers is atomically thin, let's say a few atomic layers thick. We can make these materials by simple sputtering techniques, which I'm not going to discuss. If you introduce a current into this material from the battery, then the red layer prefers the red electrons spin down, and the blue layer, the blue electrons. But however, the copper layer is so thin that the electrons will be moving in all directions, and the blue electrons will be scattered in the upper red layer, and vice versa. This means somewhere in this structure, all the electrons are strongly scattered. High resistance. Now, all we have to do is apply a magnetic field, rotate these magnetic layers, which had anti-parallel magnetic moments, to become parallel. Now, the blue electrons can now be short-circuited through this sandwich, and so the resistance is lowered. So, basically, by applying a magnetic field, we can change the orientation of these atomically thin magnetic layers, and we change the resistance. This is a magnetoresistance phenomenon. Now, this phenomenon of spin polarization of the current was actually proposed in the 1930s by Neville Mott. Neville Mott was won the Nobel Prize for an amazing series of discoveries. When I was a student in Cambridge, his office was the opposite <laughs> the region where I was building and exploring a transition metal dichroic congenite magnetic systems. Nevertheless, the change in resistance in the structure is only 10%. Nevertheless, this device I proposed as a sensor to detect magnetic fields to detect the magnetic regions in a magnetic disk drive, and we could do that 10,000 times more sensitively than any other device that's known even today. This is what enabled us to increase the storage capacity of magnetic disk drives 10,000 times in a very short period of time.
Now there's another very interesting closely related spintronic structure. This is called the magnetic tunnel junction. So you see again, you see the red and blue layers that corresponds to their magnetic moment direction. But now instead of a metallic layer in between, we have a, this thin gray layer. And this is an insulator, no electrons. So the electrons now quantum mechanically tunnel from one metallic electrode through the insulator to the opposing metallic electrode. Now the advantage of this system is that the resistance can be much higher for current perpendicular to the layers than in a metallic structure. The metallic structure, a few atomic layers thick, as in the spin valve, there's virtually no resistance in the perpendicular direction. This system has high resistance. Moreover, it has high tunneling magnetoresistance. The reason is, when you extract current from the surface of a ferromagnet, there are different numbers of electrons which spin up and spin down. They tunnel at different rates. And when the two magnetic layers are parallel, ups, the electrons can tunnel readily of one spin polarization. You switch the orientation of that one layer to the blue direction, and you switch essentially turn off the current, because there are no available empty electronic states into which those spin polarized electrons can tunnel because the spin is preserved during that process. So this type of structure can give rise at room temperature to changes in resistance when you change the orientation of these two layers of up to several hundred percent. And this is what we demonstrated in this paper in 2004 and is, is the, now the basis of a new technology to store information in what is called magnetic random access memory. And just like the cross point array for the little core memories I showed you earlier, we have a very similar idea, a cross point of wires at each intersection. We introduce a magnetic tunneling junction device where the current flows from the upper wire to the lower wire through the device. And the, this tunneling junction has sufficient resistance that we can detect its resistance, whether the moments are parallel or antiparallel, a zero and a one in a tiny amount of time in less than one nanosecond. And at the same time, if you look at the top, you can see this, remind you again, this is this, uh, the, the magnetic disk drive. We incorporated the metallic spin valve into this recording device, which moves over the, mechanically over the top of the surface of this magnetic layer at a distance today of about a few nanometers, enabling us to read the transitions between these magnetic blue and red regions with greater sensitivity than was ever possible before. Turns out this metallic spin valve was used in magnetic disk drives for 10 years, 1997 to 2007, was then replaced by this magnetic tunneling junction using the materials uh, that we proposed in 2004. Now, just as a comment, uh, I wanted to point out this. We proposed this concept of a magnetic random access memory, which is a non-volatile, we've demonstrated high performance uh, memory, that can be scaled to smaller dimensions than charge-based memories, but it took from our proposal in 1995. We first demonstrated this in two, 1999. We had a 16 megabit chip we demonstrated in 2005, but it took until 2019 that Samsung announced you can now buy in their foundries this embedded magnetic random access memory. And typically it takes 20 years or more from the discovery of a material to its application. On the other hand, uh, surprisingly, the spin valve sensor, we could, using the physics I discovered in 1988 to 1991, we could IBM could incorporate that into magnetic disk drives in just six years, which is remarkable, allowing, as I said, a 10,000-fold improvement in the capacity of magnetic disk drives. So I want to now discuss briefly another memory that I'm even more excited about. And I actually also proposed this in 2002. So now it's 20 years later and not yet available, but we believe, or I believe, it's on a path to application. And the concept is entirely different from any other memory technology today. You see in this cartoon, you can see a magnetic wire. This represents a magnetic wire, which is nanoscopic in size and maybe a few hundred nanometers tall. And this wire is a uniformly mag magnetized magnetic heterostructure. The red and blue regions magnetized in one direction and the opposite direction. And in between these regions, you have a so-called magnetic domain wall, which on a nanoscopic scale looks like a particle. It has mass, it has momentum. And what I proposed was we could pass current pulses into this wire. It becomes spin polarized and delivers spin angular momentum and can move these domain walls synchronously around the wire. You move the stored information to individual reading and writing elements we would build into the racetrack. 
That's what I proposed in 2002, and it took till 2008, and I'm very proud of this paper in science, it's nearly 5,000 citations, and <laughs> this is a fantastic uh, achievement, I think, where we demonstrated this basic principle. But again, uh, we had to go beyond that uh, and discover much new physics to make it relevant technologically. How does this work? As I mentioned before, you take a current in a magnetic material, it's spin polarized. And that spin angular momentum of these conduction electrons shown as these moving electrons in this cartoon, we can transfer that spin angular momentum to the magnetic moments in the domain wall. Roughly speaking, every time we introduce a polarized spin, it can rotate a single magnetic moment. So we need to pass enough current through this material to move the domain walls. And that's something I said we demonstrated for the first time in 2008. Due to the short time, I can't tell you all the uh, very interesting physics, but I like to consider that this concept of a racetrack memory has gone through four important stages. And I want to briefly discuss some of the physics in the result, the final stage, 4.0, because that is the racetrack that is being considered today as a possible replacement for magnetic disk drives. It would have the same storage capacity, but would be a million times faster and use 50 to 100 times less energy and would be totally reliable magnetic disk drives uh, because the mechanical can fail. So there are two things I want to discuss, both of which are chiral. chiral. First of all, many of you are familiar with the Hall effect. If you pass a current through a non-magnetic material in the presence of a magnetic field, the electrons will suffer from a Lorentz force and they will move either to the left or to the right. So you basically, you basically create a transverse voltage which is not spin polarized. Now there's an equivalent effect to the Hall effect called a spin Hall effect. You don't need any magnetic field, but in certain metals where the spin is coupled to the lattice through what is called a spin orbit coupling, you can create a transverse spin current. And this is a chiral phenomenon. So in, if on the right top, you can see this, this material, this pink material, it turns out, let's say it's platinum. We pass this current yellow through the material and you can see these arrows, they correspond to spin polarized electrons that accumulate on all the surfaces in a chiral direction. When you change the direction of the current, the chirality changes. So on the surface, we'll end up with accumulation of spin polarized electrons, no charge accumulation. And now what happens, we can use that spin polarized current and pass it into a neighboring magnetic material to create spin angular torques. And that is what we demonstrated. And today the efficiency of converting one electron into a spin polarized electron exceeds one. Some recent materials we published earlier last year, we demonstrated that every charged electron can generate two or three spin polarized electrons. That's the first. This is a chiral phenomenon. The chirality of this spin current depends on the material. Another chiral phenomenon is the domain wall itself. So going back to this very simple picture, you can see here is the racetrack. Magnetization here pointing in the red direction up, blue direction down. But in between, the magnetization rotates in a very special way. It will rotate in either a clockwise or an anti-clockwise direction. You can see at the bottom, you can see here is the magnetization pointing down. And as it rotates to the up direction, you see in the middle, the magnetic moment here is pointing to the left. But when it rotates from an up to a down direction, that magnetic moment points to the right. And it turns out it has a chirality. This is introduced by the same material in which we see this spin hole effect. We introduce, we grow our regular materials. This is a the racetrack is typically made from, let's say, cobalt, nickel cobalt. These layers are one or two to three angstroms thick. And underneath, we have this orange layer, which could be platinum. Platinum not only gives the spin hole effect and spin currents, at the interface, it gives rise to a very interesting type of proximity exchange, which is called a Dielezinski Maria vector exchange, which gives rise to these chiral structures. Very important. And another point we have to take advantage of or take control are dipole fields. So you all know that a magnet generates fields. So the Earth has its own magnetic field. Now, these magnetic fields are long range and cause interactions from one racetrack to the other on the nanoscopic scale. They increase approximately inversely with the size. So even for the spin valve device, originally one had to control 
the dipole fields from one of those magnetic layers in the sandwich. And I had proposed, even at that time, we could do it with something called synthetic antiferromagnet. And this is the only reason why we could make spin valves and why we can make magnetic tunnel junction MRAM devices. So if you look at this cartoon, you see here is the a lower racetrack where the magnetization rotates from up to down. You end this with a chiral, this is actually a nail wall because the moment here is pointing perpendicular to the uh, transition. We create on top a second racetrack, which is exactly a mirror image of the lower one. So the moment in the lower racetrack is exactly mirror imaged by an opposite moment in the upper racetrack. In this way, all along the racetrack, the net magnetization is zero and we can eliminate the dipole fields. Without this, we cannot build any type of magnetic device. And this actually was an invention of mine and based on my discovery of long range oscillatory interlayer coupling, it turns out if you take a thin layer of ruthenium, seven angstroms thick, it will give rise to this amazing strong antiferromagnetic coupling so we can make this mirror copy. By making this mirror copy, we discovered if we now pass current into this racetrack, the velocity of the domain walls at the same current density as we make it more and more balanced increases by up to a factor of five to 10. So now we can move these domain walls five to 10 times faster than we could have imagined when I first started this project in 2002. This is totally new physics, but it means we can move these domain walls extremely efficiently at high speeds, exceeding one kilometer per second, in these racetracks where there's no net magnetization, no dipole fields, perfect, the only way to make an application. Now, how do we see these domain walls? So when I was at IBM, we did this by microscopy, so-called Kerr microscopy. You shine a light which is polarized in one direction, and when it's reflected from a magnetic material, the plane of polarization slightly rotates to the right or to the left, depending upon the direction of the magnetic moment in this racetrack. We take a snapshot and then we apply a current pulse and then we take another snapshot and we can see then 20 domain walls you see here moving backwards and forwards in a regular racetrack, a single ferromagnetic layer. Underneath, here's a cartoon of this synthetic antiferromagnet. We have this platinum layer, we have these uh, one nanometer thick cobalt, nickel cobalt, ruthenium, seven angstrom thick, cobalt, nickel cobalt, and this has no net magnetization, so it's more difficult to image. These domain walls here are moving much faster. So this is because of chirality of the domain walls. If we could not control the chirality, the domain walls would be moving in random directions. They only move in the same direction with current if they have the same chirality, and it's based on spin currents derived from this spin Hall effect. This is what makes it possible. Now, at Max Planck, since I came, we have, uh, with some funding from Samsung, we've shown we can go from micron sized racetracks down to nanometer sized racetracks. Turns out everything works exactly the same, same velocities. And we've now built, for example, a device where we have a single domain wall. We move it backwards and forwards and detect its position from a integrated magnetic tunnel junction, and we can do this on a time scale of less than 500 picoseconds, and extremely low energy. So we believe this is a very interesting single domain wall device, super high performance, which we could use to replace the densest memory today in charge-based world of electronics, which is called static random access memory. Now, probably running out of time, but I want to briefly discuss if there's time. Uh, we can go beyond domain walls, and it turns out 10 years ago, Christian Fleidre at the Technical University in Munich discovered something called a, a block skirmion, a magnetic material where normally the magnetization is fixed in a single direction. He discovered that in a, as a function of temperature and magnetic field, suddenly it forms an hexagonal array of tiny objects called skirmions whose energy is lowered by the formation of a chiral domain wall using exactly the same methods that I briefly discussed earlier. Now, I, the earlier domain wall, you can also form these skirmions with a nail domain wall, similar to the domain wall I showed you in our racetrack. In this case, the magnetization rotates outside, it's pointing up. Inside this object, it's pointing in the opposite direction. And uh, along this radius, the magnetization rotates in a chiral direction. In the block skirmion case, the magnetization rotates not along the radius, but perpendicular to the radius along the tangent. And it turns out that with theoretical predictions, we could see another object called an antiskirmion, where in this case, because of the symmetry of the crystal lattice, uh, 
This Dilizhinsky-Maria vector exchange has different sign of its vector components as you move around in the lattice structure if you have the right symmetry. And there was a prediction you could see something called an antiskermion, where the boundary alternates between block-like domain walls to nail-type domain walls. And we were the first to discover this. And how did we do that? We discovered it by taking a single crystal. Turns out these were made by Claudia, my wife, in Dresden. And we take a very thin layer. We, we cut a thin layer out using focused ion beam milling techniques, which is electron transparent, less than 200 nanometers thick. We pass this uh, high energy beam, 300,000 volt electron beam, through that layer. And we detect through Lorentz forces, the same Lorentz forces that give rise to the ordinary Hall effect, we now, the electrons have moved uh, because of uh, um, forces from in-plane components of the magnetization. And a nail skirmion actually, if you image it, you'll see nothing, but a block skirmion, you'll see the electron beam is focused towards the middle of that skirmion. It would look like this. And we predicted that an anti skirmion would show as the electron beam trans was transmitted, there'll be two regions of high intensity white, two regions of low intensity black. And I think you can see, here is the image we saw. This is an anti skirmion The first observation, it's about 200 nanometers in size. And we published this five years ago. And we showed that as a function of magnetic field and temperature, we could evolve these structures into more complex uh, uh, beasts. And also, we found that by changing, simply changing the thickness of this layer through which we image these anti skirmions you can see this in this case, this is an image using a different technique. We basically take a magnetic tip, move it across the surface, look at the displacement, and we're now looking at the outer plane component, and these little dots correspond to anti skirmions increasing in size as we increase the thickness of this, this layer through which we're looking from a few hundred nanometers to four microns. Now, this whole area of science of these non-collinear spin textures has uh, been very interesting in the last few years. And we ourselves showed the same material in which we can see these anti skirmions We actually can see another object. You see these elliptical objects where we can stabilize these objects because the wall now is entirely of a block wall type, which has the lowest dipole-dipole energy interaction. So we can convert anti skirmions into elliptical block skirmions, and one proposal we have is maybe we could build a racetrack where we store information not as the absence or presence of a domain wall, but as an anti skirmion or an elliptical block skirmion. This would be very difficult to do, but we can see a combination of these objects uh, experimentally, and of course we can simulate this using micromagnetic simulations. Now, how much time do I have? One minute? More time, okay, I have more time. So, I want to finally talk about uh, our current project, which is I propose this, uh, only we've been working on this two years, and we already think it's super exciting. We want to make a, what I call a, a super track, a uh, racetrack memory that would operate at ultra low temperatures to support quantum computing. So many of you are familiar with quantum computing, a lot of excitement, and one of the most exciting quantum computing ideas is to use a spin as a qubit. I'm not gonna talk about that, but if you ever want to make this happen, we'll operate at very low temperatures, and you need a memory, a conventional memory, that will store the parameters to set up the quantum computer and to read the output of the quantum uh, computer after it has performed its function. To do this, you need a memory that operates at ultra-low temperatures, 10 millikelvin. And basically today there is nothing. However, Racetrack comes to the rescue, and with Racetrack we can build a super track. And we want to do this using two ideas. One is we want to build supercurrents in which the supercurrent is carried by so-called triplet pairing. So perhaps many of you know, in a superconducting material, again, the electrons pair up with opposite spins to create a boson, and you form a macroscopic quantum state in which the bosons can be moved with no dissipation. So basically, no resistance, no voltage. Well, this is called a supercurrent. Now, it turns out that if we could create that same Cooper pair, with the electron spins parallel, in principle, this is called a triplet pair, pairing, we could create a supercurrent carrying spin angular momentum. Therefore, we would have a current without any dissipation, which we could use to manipulate magnetization. This has never been demonstrated, but two years ago we demonstrated that by again coming back to these non-collinear spin textures, we could use one of these to create 
by proximity with a conventional superconductor, this is niobium, where the Cooper pairs are formed from antiparallel spin pairs, we could create triplet pair ring in this non-collinear spin texture. Don't have any detailed time to discuss this, but this is a chiral Kagome antiferromagnet, and we showed the supercurrent could be propagated over long distances. And more recently, demonstrated something for the first time, which you probably have not have any time, it's called a Joseon diode effect. We've demonstrated, now you can imagine, if you pass a supercurrent in a material, if the current is too big, eventually you destroy the superconductivity. And this is, there's, a current, there's a supercurrent critical density below which the supercurrent will flow with no dissipation and above which it looks like it becomes dissipative. You destroy the Cooper pairs. Well, it turns out normally, this, you can see in this picture, we've taken this, you see this little irregularly shaped, this is, it turns out it's a 2D material, it's a nickel ditelluride, it's a very special material, which is a Dirac semi-metal, it has surface states which are spin polarized, and then on top of this we create these, these wires, these are formed from niobium, a conventional S-wave superconductor. We pass current into this non-superconducting material, it becomes superconducting by proximity, and we found at these lowest temperatures that the critical supercurrent density for current flowing left to right or right to left was the same, but in the presence of a tiny magnetic field perpendicular to the supercurrent, we found that these critical supercurrent density is distinctly different. First time, Joseon diode effect. And this means that if you pass a current to the left, it's dissipation free. You pass it to the right, it uh, will be dissipative. So we could use this to detect domain walls. So my current program is we want to use, build a super mint or super track, a cryogenic racetrack memory, which would basically consume very little energy. We would pass, create triplet supercurrents in the very special ways, pass them into the racetrack, they would deliver angular momentum, the domain walls would move, and we would detect them using this Joseon diode effect. So we think this is a very interesting concept and we're working hard on this. Final comment, in the five years I've been at Max Planck, we built this system. We believe it's one of the world's most sophisticated systems for building atomically engineered materials using different techniques that are required to deposit different types of materials. So we have molecular beam epitaxy here, but this is something we, own, we built ourselves. We call it Mango. It has 44 different sources where we can sputter using magnetron and ion beam sputtering. We also have something called pulse laser deposition. And all of these systems are connected through this. You see this orange tube. It's 15 meters long. We've designed it so we can automatically, under computer control, take a substrate from one of these systems to another system and deposit layers from one atomic layer to several atomic layers thick to create entirely new materials that we hope will change the world. So, summary, spin valve sensors, uh, they're green, already makes, basically makes possible the digital world of today, I like to think. Magnetic tunnel junctions, it's green, we've met, we succeeded, it took 25 years. Uh, high performance, non-volatile memory, it's one of the most interesting emerging memories today. Racetrack memory, you see a little less, little less green. We think with the materials we have and the new physics we've discovered, uh, this could replace magnetic disk drives in the next five to 10 years, a million times faster, a hundred times lower energy, and even we could replace the fastest charge-based volatile memory today with a non-volatile memory, will be smaller in size, use much less energy, and would make computing systems much more powerful. And of course, the whole zoology of non-collinear spin texture is super exciting, not clear they would have any real application. And finally, will be an application, triplet superconductivity. By the way, there is no known bulk triplet superconductor, but we can create it using superconducting spintronics. And I think this cryogenic racetrack, again, could be a, a fantastically interesting memory that could support quantum computing. And if you're interested, here's some of our most recent papers on these two concepts, racetrack and um, this super track. And then I just want to acknowledge all of my collaborators, my students and postdocs in Halle. We collaborate with other groups around the world, including Liang Fu's group at MIT and Takis Kontos group at the Eco Normal Superior as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Prof. Martin. We invite Prof. Lam to moderate the Q&A. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Parkin, for this really impactful and, and exciting talk. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah.
So we can now take some questions for the online attendees. Uh, let's start with uh, toggling between the right and the left. Oh, wow. Hi, still talking. Uh, pro hi, Professor. Uh, I'm Timothy Ng from NTU Singapore. So we were, uh, Singapore is very excited about artificial intelligence, right? So we know that AI cons uh, requires large computational models and large neural networks. That, that consumes a lot of computational power and memory storage. So what do you think about uh, your new, I mean, your magnetics, uh, your racetrack memory, right? Uh, how impact, how, how can it impact how we uh, do AI in the future? So AI is basically made possible by the fact that we can have so much data stored digitally, which is the lifeblood of artificial intelligence and machine learning. You need to store that all that data has to be stored. And of course, magnetic disk drives consume a lot of energy. So today, currently, about 7% 7 of all electricity is consumed by data centers where the data is stored. So if we could reduce that energy by 100 times using racetrack, that would have a huge impact. We'd eliminate 7% of all the electricity used today. So that's one uh, way in which um, I think racetrack could play a very important role. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you for your interesting talk. I have a basic question about the data security in computing. Like, what could we do to keep the security in data production and transformation or use of the data or also like writing or uh, reading the data in storage? Well, you know, that's a very interesting question. Um, Little to do with Spintronics, but nevertheless, a super interesting question. Like even Max Planck, uh, I know one major institute suffered a ransomware attack just a few weeks ago, lost all their data. This is a super important problem, cyber security. And um, not clear to me that, um, well, how Spintronics could address that question. It's a very interesting one. I don't really have an answer. But make sure all your data is backed up beyond <laughs> a single magnetic disk drive. I will, thank you. Next question, please. Hi, Professor. Thanks for the wonderful talk. So um, there's a new emerging field um, of optical skirmions, where you tune the pol local polarization states of light to create these non-trivial topological states. Mm -hmm. And in the material science world, people use them, and they normally quote in their papers that they are resilient to noise and that to, to perturbations. What kind of perturbations are these? Because whenever we try to publish papers on optical skirmions, we get this criticism that uh, it's not unclear what kind of uh, noise or global uh, operations that these things are invariant to. Okay, so I, think I would answer two ways. One is, of course, optics, very, very interesting. But, um, and the concept of using different types of optical phenomena to store data is a very, very old one. However, typically, photons simplistically are too big. So it's difficult to make devices where you can store enormous amounts of data using photons, unless you use super resolution techniques, for example. Nevertheless, I would say more interesting in my mind for skirmions is the use of optical probes to manipulate the skirmions, to change their structure, to create them by using the photons themselves, intense photon beams. And this has been demonstrated that, for example, you can reverse magnetization or you can create regions which are skirmions using intense optical probes. I think this is much more interesting, using ultra super resolution techniques. And, and what noise mechanisms are they resilient to? So this actually, this concept, you know, op optical beams can carry angular momentum and angular momentum again can, 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 can be used to uh, manipulate magnetization, but it turns out at the same time you get a lot of heating. So this has been very controversial. It was shown in the 1990s that you could reverse magnetization of a magnetic material on a picosecond timescale, which is why it's interesting, but nevertheless it was mostly determined to be by heat. So thermal effects play a very important role. Thanks, Paul. Uh, hello, Professor. My name is Shoknadeep. I'm from India and I completed my PhD from Hong Kong. So my question is for the emerging memory technologies. For example, if we compare the magnetic RAMs with the phase change RAMs or the resistive RAMs, what gives MRAM its competitive edge over the other types of emerging non-volatile memories, particularly for uh, speed and device scalability when our RAMs have already reached like Four nanometer square size and speed of 85 picosecond. Is it the device-to-device -device variability, or what factors make MRAM more commercially viable? 
compared to... So our RAM is very interesting and there are different approaches to building resistive random access memory including phase change and then uh, this memory has been under development for 30 years and uh, has not found its way into the marketplace or it did briefly and the reason is that when you, let's say a phase change memory which you change a material from a, a crystalline to amorphous state by going to high temperatures and changing the cooling rate so it cools into an amorphous state or cools more slowly into a crystalline state, it turns out you get thermal expansion or contraction and this basically causes damage. And it's not possible to do that reliably over long periods of time. So typically uh, convention, any memory has to nominally survive for 10 years after trillions of operations. The phase change uh, resistive memory concepts don't appear to be very reliable. So there have been no resistive or uh, memory or phase change memory may, has, has made its way into the marketplace for these reasons. And so I would say magnetic materials, on the other hand, where we only, let's say in racetrack, we don't move any atoms. Any time you move atoms, we typically have problems. So similarly, <coughs> ferroelectric memories have been around for a long time. Again, you have to move atoms. These atomic motions eventually cause failure. However, Magnetic racetrack, we only rotate the spin. Nothing to do with the atoms. Therefore, super reliable. And how easy it is to tune the different resistance states in MRAM compared to RRAM, PCM, or FRAM uh, yeah. for the neuromorphic <coughs> computing applications? Yeah, yeah. So again, for neuromorphic applications, racetrack memory is fantastic because you can build a racetrack in which you basically move a domain wall in one magnetic layer and not in the other one. And then if it's basically a magnetic tunneling junction, you can create a thousand analog states, which is typically what you need for neuromorphic computing applications as a resistive element in a cross-point architecture. So this means we can create highly reliable, highly controllable states. Uh, and I didn't have time to discuss this bit on our racetrack. We've demonstrated we can move the main wall with a precision of better than 40 nanometers for positions 100 nanometers apart. So if we can build a vertical racetrack, which we're close to doing, we could build an element that would be, I think, perfect for, uh, uh, for, for artificial synapse. So we just heard about synapse. But uh, of course, we and others are trying to create artificial synapse using non-conventional, non-biological materials. And in terms of the like the scalability of the devices, so those typical RMs or RM specifically, they only depend the device size depends on the top electrode size. So isn't the scalability of the devices much easier compared to MRAMs where you have to scale down the magnetic domains and they have a limitation? Or well, another problem with uh, resistive random access memory, which typically relies on moving atoms, let's say oxygen atoms in a in a material, is that typically you create an atomic uh, atomic connection and you're moving atoms around within that atomic connection and it's unreliable and moreover does not, you basically it's unscalable, basically the same independent resistance, independent of size. And then the thermal effects become dramatic on the nanoscale, so it does not scale very well. On the other hand, magnetic random access memory has already been scaled to dimensions below 10 nanometers by Samsung, so it seems like it's totally scalable. Let's uh, take a break from the uh, attendee and then we will okay. look at one of the online questions. Uh, one of the questions online asks, uh, how long do you estimate that a quantum state could be retained in uh, the super racetrack memory? Oh yeah, um, it's very interesting. So we just have a proposal, we just put it on, on the archive with Daniel Loss, who's a theorist at the University of Basel, who's one of the pioneers in understanding quantum computing. And we proposed that we could use one of these chiral domain walls as a qubit, where the zero, if you like, we would change from a clockwise to an anti-clockwise domain wall and this we believe could be a very interesting theoretical proposal for a qubit. This is something we're working on. Okay, so, so yeah. what sort of time scale would you expect to, to have those memory lasting? Oh, time scale? Oh, well, uh, you know, we haven't, we haven't uh, made any such device yet, but we would of course anticipate that, uh, that we would design it so the time scales would, would be related to whatever barrier was needed to go from one state to the other, and so it could be whatever time we wanted. Could be long. All right, thanks. Yep. I believe. <laughs> um, Since we haven't done it, it's easy for me to say. <laughs> next question. Yeah, thank okay. you very much for your talk. I was really impressed by, uh, in particular, the images. And actually, when you introduced the racetrack, you had this beautiful illustration of the mirror image of the domains, which mm. I couldn't help but think of DNA. Oh, okay. Um, and I was wondering, mm. um, and I'm glad that Sir Klenemann is in the room, mm. is there a, a realm where 
You could use racetrack and the, the high speeds to sequence DNA, for example, using mm. uh, microfluidics for a channel and combining it with the unique chirality of each nucleotide. Well, that's a really interesting question. I think maybe you should answer the question. <laughs> But let me answer it differently. It turns out there, of course, there have been interesting ideas to use giant magnet resistance to uh, separate molecules by uh, taking nanoparticles. And then on the surface, you put some kind of chemical that will be attracted to some aspect, some, some aspect of DNA or something. And you could use this to separate molecules in this way. But I think that's in its infancy. Concepts are now more than 15 years old. So I, I don't really have a, a good answer to your question. Very interesting one. Thank you. But no answer. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the very interesting talk. Uh, my question is more on a basic scale. I uh, understand from my work at the Institute of High Performance Computing that different applications uh, have different requirements for data storage. So whether that be speed, reliability, or capacity. So when you design the racetrack uh, memory, how do you balance between all these three uh, requirements? And could you comment on in your opinion, which of these are the most important when like, designing memory for high-performance computing applications? Okay, so high-performance computing, you have a whole series of memories uh, at different levels. And so level zero would be on the chip itself. On the chip, you would build typically SRAM because that's compatible with the transistors for the circuits. Uh, however, as you know, half the chip today is SRAM. And it's anticipated as you scale to smaller and smaller dimensions, the size of a single SRAM, single static random access memory, will be expanding. So there's a few hundred so-called F squared today, the minimum, minimum lithographic dimension that's going to explode. So it's not possible. So if we could use a single domain wall racetrack to replace static random access memory, that would already have huge impact on high performance, high performance computing because at the L0 level, we could put in more memory and it would be non-volatile, therefore uh, would use less energy. But as you go into the stack at high levels, of course, uh, eventually if we could replace all the disk drives with uh, racetrack, that would also be a much faster and reliable. It would be a million times faster. So that would have huge impact on computing systems. But your question is a very good one. So in some sense, you have to design these memories to have different performances and different densities, let's say. Uh, so typically you have SRAM, big, very not dense, but high performance less than a nanosecond. But with racetrack, we can get density and speed. So it looks super interesting. Thank you. One last question before we break. Thank you, Professor. Uh, my question is about applications to outer space conditions. Mm -hmm. Like what, uh, what could be the possible changes to the magnetic properties in space conditions and effects on the magnetic sensors, such as spin valve sensors and skirions. Thank you. So it turns out that when we first proposed magnetic random access, ma magnetic random access memory in 1995, it was because the military in the United States, the so-called Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, wanted a memory that was radiation hard. And it turns out all charge-based memories have problems that you create in, in space. Radiation creates charges and can destroy the the memory, but magnetic random access memory, because the information is encoded in the magnetic moment, has no such issues. So it turns out for space applications, these magnetic memories are very important because they're not charge-based. And it turns out this core memory I showed you was one of the very earliest memories used in space because, again, it's radiation hard. Thank you all for contributing to these uh, very interesting questions. Um, I think it's time for us to break for lunch. Uh, please join me again to thank uh, Professor Stuart Parkin. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Parkin and Professor Lam.